thank you so much for being here, sir. Uh, Mr. Chandra Sakar has uh, 28 years of experience in embedded product development space. Uh, specifically uh, when it comes to automotive products, uh, that is in the last 14 years. Uh, Mr. Chandra Sakar's uh, particular expertise pertains to ISO uh, 21434 uh, and the automotive security ISO 26262 uh, automotive safety uh, fields within uh, automotive security and uh, the surrounding industry of automotive products. Uh, Mr. Chandra Sakar uh, has a strong services engagement experience with OEMs, T1 services and semiconductor organizations. He has uh, extensive insight into providing solutions in connected car solutions, uh, chassis systems, EV products and uh, telematic areas. And uh, also, he's the head of the organization Sri Rushi Consulting Services when it comes uh, to technical services, training and staffing services. Uh, he has experience in establishing new uh, centers of excellence, uh, such as competency management of engineers towards new technical services, uh, as well as uh, Mr. Chandra Sakar has major involvement in developing the very first generation of virtual page, the RTOS kernel. With that, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Chandra Shakar for being here today once more. And uh, I would like to share my screen uh, so that you will be able to see uh, the very exciting video content uh, that he prepared for us. Uh, enjoy. Adam, I think there is some issue with the audio. We'll just see, we can just check it out and I think Chandra sir can just start speaking for a minute. Uh, there's something wrong with the audio. The video doesn't have volume. I am not able to hear it. So Chandra Shekhar sir, I... Yeah, you can play still like that. So audio is not there, that's fine. They can see that at least. Okay. You can start from the beginning so that they can... Context. What you are seeing in this video is somebody is trying to hack the vehicles. So when you can hack the vehicles, what can happen on the roads? This one is just example. You don't have your hole on your vehicle. The damage, safety, injuries, financial damage, Operational damage, privacy of data. This kind of impact cannot be calculated. All this is what you have seen. It is not impossible. So, can we I'll share my presentation now? Okay. Yes, sir. I will uh, put you on the spotlight so that you appear on everyone's screen. And I will mute myself. Can I? Can I start? Oh, yes, of course, sir. All of you can see my screen. Yes, perfectly, sir. OK, so good morning, good evening all to all of you. So thanks for the introduction uh, and thanks for all my predecessors who have set the correct context of the cybersecurity 
Today I'm going to discuss with you an automotive based cyber security. Why it is different? So you all of you may know, but we'll start from scratch. Since many of you may not be related to automotive industry, I'll start from some basics and we'll move forward on standards, implementation, and the latest technologies and how it is impacting the cyber security also we'll discuss. So at the end, uh, we'll have some time for your questions. So if the time is not sufficient, please send your questions to me. I can share my email ID. Okay. So today we, uh, we have, you have seen the video, right? This video essentially talks about the impact of a vulnerability in the car and the infrastructure. Right? A cyber security hacker can take the advantage of the same and then you can do anything. See, there is a difference on the impact of cybersecurity from a normal computer system and a car. I'll tell you the reason. If you are hacked, your computer is hacked, your data is gone, you may lose your data. That can be a financial loss, that can be a privacy loss. But if you lose the connectivity, if you lose basically the protection of your car, that means somebody can hack your car computer systems inside. That means the safety of the car is, is a big thing. Normally, that's not the case with other scenarios if it is not a vehicle. But if it is a vehicle if, and your car is hacked, the first impact is safety, safety of the driver and passengers, right? Because of that, automotive cybersecurity has taken very high priority in the world today. Okay, we'll see how it goes, right? You have seen the, the video. And you'll see the impact of that. So let's go through the how the automotive industry is placed. Okay. Now everybody knows. Let's say if you are buying a TV, right? The TV, the manufacturer, the Samsung or LG, whoever it is, they will have their own service providers, right? They cannot do everything on their own. But in case of car, it is much much bigger. The supply chain is very big, and and the OEM de definitely depends on every one of them. Okay, for example, a a car manufacturer, it can be GM, it can be anybody, Volkswagen, whoever, they will be depending heavily on the first tier one suppliers. I'll tell you what is tier one suppliers. Let's say you have the power steering in your car, you have instrument cluster in your car, you have ABS braking system in your car. All of these products are not designed and developed by the OEMs. Most of them are designed by, manufactured by the tire ones. They'll tailor fit that product for the particular OEM. So take the examples of the world big companies of tire ones, like the Bosch, Robert Bosch, Continental. These are all the people who develop the products. They are, they are maintaining those technologies for several years and they are pioneers in those technologies. They develop the products and then they supply it to OEM. OEM, OEM will manufacture while manufacturing. They will fit these products and then deploy it in the field. Okay, so now that means tire ones also they depend upon a lot of their suppliers. So for example, uh, the power steering. The power steering not only having the electronics. It, it's not just electronic controlling unit. It is having a motor. It is having a shock. It is having a lot of sensors, some smart actuators. Many things are there. So that means they depend upon a lot of components and from the other suppliers, the T2 suppliers. So, and that some of those T2 supplier components are very smart. Even for the, the ECU, electronic uh, control unit, the component, the electronic components, the passive or active components, they're also manufactured by T2 suppliers, right? So it's the entire supply chain is very important to understand the cyber security. I will explain it a little later again. So there are other companies like, see, service organizations. A lot of uh, companies they develop the cybersecurity stacks, the solutions, and then they are they are basically supplying to tier one, tier two products, and they are being deployed to OEM. But one point you need to understand is, OEMs have to maintain the synchronization. OEMs have to have the complete framework in which all the tier ones have to be binded. If everybody deploys their, their own way of uh, cybersecurity, OEM cannot control their own vehicles, right? 
so that's the reason cyber security responsibility is belong to oem okay. the oem means the original end manufacturer the car manufacturer i would say they, it, it can be a truck manufacturer it can be a car manufacturer it is a two wheeler manufacturer it can be any any vehicle manufacturer okay so with this move forward generally how a, a vehicle looks like right today so today the vehicle looks like this there are so many electronic components and mechanical components they get interconnected they are all are connected with their own networking system called can bus system there are other bus systems like flexray and other ethernet also but the can is most predominant in the industry today so these all these uh, that that's called e architecture we'll see what is called e architecture electrical and electronic architecture the bus architecture so uh, with that all of the ecus are connected ecus means electronic control units now when all these ecus are there that means the a vehicle is completely isolated right stand alone person not that but but that's not the case a big each and every vehicle talk talk to a back end cloud system through a telematic control unit that means the all the vehicles will have a telematic telematic control unit and they will be connected to the individual bus networks and where the ecus will be connected you can see this here different networks have different ecus connected ecus connected here and finally this telematic system is connected to the back end server so if we go to the next slide these are different types of e and e and architecture electrical and electronic architecture there are golden days so many of the ecus are stand alone but later they are all basically connected to the can network nowadays it is advanced to the domain controllers that means many issues are getting together to make one the domain controller the future is the zonal architecture it's going that way so if you see that the the interfaces and all basically the consolidated that means there lot of smart actuators smart sensors are coming into the picture here with this big picture Vehicle, a advanced vehicle looks like this. Look at this. How many kinds of ECUs are connected? How many interfaces are there? You can think that each interface is sharing some data with external board or external ECU or external interface to incorporate or to support a functionality of the vehicle. However, that's the good thing of the interface. However, each interface can be a door for you to door for a hacker to get into your system. right so there are some internal networks external networks the car is becoming very complicated entity today okay we'll see how the cyber security so now because of all these interfaces and everything so cyber security is becoming complex how it has to be incorporated how it need to be handled right a lot of standards are coming up right a lot of technologies are coming up so the good thing is the good news is cyber security is not new today cyber security is old so the cryptology is old but how the way it need to be implemented in a particular industry is the challenge okay you go to the vehicles and security this is a latest report uh, look at this one so cyber security is going up cyber security threats are going up okay. if you look at it one of the criteria 89% of the the threats are coming from communication channels what are these communication channels the communication with the external world like the cloud system the communication within the ecus the vehicle the communication with the wireless interfaces something like that right see the second thing threats to the vehicle data excuse me yeah chandra sir i think you can just go to the slide show mode yeah 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 this is not visible it's a little you know small okay. so it will be better if you can move the slide show yeah perfect perfect so a lot of threats coming to the system are coming through the channels communication channels just imagine that each communication channel can be a, a door entry to your car for somebody to hack your data somebody to hack and then control your vehicle okay so 
what what would happen so they somebody they somebody grabs the communication channel control that means they can handle what is the data what is the data you are getting into it they can send some kind of new applications to your system to to behave it differently there are so many other different scenarios are there and now if you uh, remember in olden days embedded system products are being developed with the focus on the hardware with the focus on the software design with the focus on how to deploy it in the vehicle now it is extended to more to more steps how a product need to be safe enough to give the to give correct functionality for example safety means if you are handling a power steering and you are based the way you are giving the displacement on the steering it should be accordingly giving the direction turn right the slip angle should be as less as possible but if it is acting very less or very more its safety of the vehicle will not be there right but now the point is the the data which is controlling the steering movement if that is hacked then that is the vehicle control is completely not in your hands right the security impacts the safety the threats to the vehicles regarding their their external connectivity and connections there are so many varieties are there now let's understand this we were talking about lot of interfaces right how those interfaces how those interfaces are there this is a, a kind of a snapshot of how a typical vehicle can uh, look like right so it will have a typical battery management okay and then the primary thing is the telematic unit will be there which will be connected to your crowd system that's the entry point to your vehicle okay but within the vehicle there are so many all these ecus are connected to each other through different can networks it's not one can network for example all of the power train and then chassis systems can be in one network all of the input and input related data can be on another can network and all these can networks are get together through a can gateway generally okay that means somebody can hack the can gateway he gets the entire data of the vehicle right now on other hand some ecus like uh, the infotainment system in the vehicle the people call it as head unit okay this head unit will have various interfaces it will have a bluetooth interface so that you you can talk to somebody through your mobile it will have the wifi it will have the 4g and 3g connection so that you can get the content from the 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 content providers for example you are looking for a song to play actually it is coming from some other website right it is content is coming here so there is 4g connect connectivity is also there now lot of other issues in the vehicle they have connectivity with the sensors sensors are again two types the normal sensors and the smart sensors the smart sensors have the electronic connectivity again wherever the electronic connectivity is there there is a cyber security threat because it acts as a asset right asset of asset means actually data channel am i going speed or is it okay uh, i think yeah you're going at the correct speed sir it works sure so i just wanted to give you a snapshot of the supply chain of the industry who are all involved how the way the cyber security has an impact let's take a look at it it's a simple one uh, but it actually it's much much more but we just try to make it little simpler to make it you know make a uh, clear presentation to you so oem generally is responsible for the entire cyber security framework that means so how how each and every ecu need to follow security phenomena in that particular vehicle right so if what kind of keys the cyber security cryptology will use keys right what kind of key management need to be done with the vehicles how each um, each kind of ecu should follow hms hsm evita standards how what kind of uh, algorithms are used for different kinds of uh, communications how the white listing need to be done the different uh, parameters will be there so the oem will essentially create a framework in which all the tier ones are binded have to be binded okay now with and then tier ones are the responsible as i said for the each and every product we in the cyber security terminology it is called item so item can be equivalent to a product in in this terminology for example if you take power steering it is an item in the cyber security terminology 
you take a cluster, it is a item in the cybersecurity technology. So tier ones are designing and developing their own products. They will have to follow the guidelines of the cybersecurity, which is set by OEM. And OEMs normally set these guidelines as per the standards and how they how those standards mean to them in their organizations. Right? So they have to follow that. So the tier one, tier twos, if they have the smart actuator, smart sensor, they have to follow that. These semiconductor organizations are playing good role these days. Like everybody knows, they have all the controllers, they have the HSMs today. It just means hardware security modules. Okay. Hardware security modules contains the, the cyber security data, their keys and the relevant information. So how, if you, uh, all of you may know, so um, the, there was a project called Evita. So that project's purpose was to create cybersecurity related requirements, how a embedded product need to behave, right? So Evita has come up with some standards. We'll discuss more about that. Based on that, so but Evita project has been stopped in 2015, I guess, but the, the research was continued. Now the present HSM standards are much more advanced. The services, the services organizations, they are creating this tag as per the standards. They are creating solutions and they are basically identifying the, uh, the threat analysis. Let us say uh, the, the different cars have different kinds of in the threat because their solutions are different. If you look at a low end car in the industry, they, it might have a very low level uh, connected car solutions. But if you look at a luxury car, the connected car solutions are very, very high, very high, extremely high. So because the outside connectivity is extremely high, so their threat analysis need to be done a little more deeply. The solutions have to go a little more deeply. The Because of that, the services organizations, they come up with the different solutions, how the way it need to be done. So standards, as of, this is very important here. So you and me, they have created the entire Europe follows today the standard WP29. In that WP29, they have two uh, regulations. One is called R155 and another one is R156. R155 talks about the cybersecurity management system. That means how an organization need to establish a cybersecurity management system in their organization, right? So similarly, a, so 156 talks about software update management system. It talks about how OEM need to update the software in every one of the issues within the vehicle, even dynamically, right? So if there is any problem, there is any update, how the software has to go. Similarly, all of you are having mobiles. Your mobile is having the software update, right, from their manufacturer sometimes. Similarly, the through the telematics of the vehicle, the software update need to come to the vehicle. How that need to be done, the standardization, the rules and regulations, the methods, it has been given in the R156. We'll, have, we'll see more information there. But all of that consolidated, how it need to be implemented. For example, how how do you how a tire one need to perceive cybersecurity for their product design and development? That has been detailed in the ISO 21434. We'll see more of that. So there is another standard called 24089, which is more relevant for the R156 sums. Okay. There are Thus, few countries like China and many other countries, they are establishing their own standards and in addition to these things. Right? So with this, I just wanted to tell one more thing. Earlier, there was a standard called J3061. Now, nowadays, they do, I believe, personally believe, and everybody agree that 21434 supersedes that. Now, we talk about uh, the This is this is ISO 21434. I will have more details a little later, but just to understand, there are several levels here. The chapter five, the six, the seven, the, the some of the chapters five and six, they create the infrastructure, cybersecurity infrastructure. That means the technical infrastructure, I would say. So how it need to be implemented in your organization and how it need to be designed implemented, validated, and deployed. Okay. So from the chapter eight and all, how you technically do the activity of cybersecurity for your product. So, and then finally this uh, TARA, the 15, 
one chapter is basically part of nine, I would say, because Tara is without Tara, you cannot go for the cybersecurity goals and all. Okay. We'll have more details. This is one slide just explains about the uh, ISO. Uh, uh, it's about R156, some software update management system. So all the OEMs are establishing this. The first standard has been released. Uh, the people are working on the first standard. Now the the final, the next two consolidated standard will come probably by, by end of the 2022, and probably it will be mandatory to deploy all the systems by 2024. That's the assumption and then understanding everybody, every OEM is having today. Okay. So this is a consolidation of everything. Look at this. Uh, any particular vehicle will have a telematic unit as an entry point to get your data from the cloud system, right? It will have a lot of issues, right? And then the big things are telematic control unit, that's TCU, and then infotainment, vehicle uh, infotainment, in vehicle infotainment. This will have more interfaces. But if you look at the uh, network, the most of the um, most of the trucks and most of the luxury vehicles, and everybody is trying to have two networks today. That means not even one work, even one network is not good. At least you should not stop control, stop communicating with the backend, right? So the people are having two networks. People are, uh, every ECU will go through the the tier one level end of the line testing, and the, it will go to the OEM level end of the line testing, and then and a lot of standards are coming for the the protection. The AIS 140. Somebody is traveling alone in the bus. They wanted to, if they are in danger, they need to communicate with the backend OEM and then the police system. This, this is a standard called AES 140. This is also mandatory. That means the, the load and expectation on the telematics today is very high. It's not as similar to the one, one, 10 years or five years back. So much of functionality and it is a gateway to the entire vehicle. And it is basically responsible for the safety. It, will, it is responsible for the AES 140 communication. So many things are there. So because of that, so the following the standard and validating as per the standards and deploying as per the standards is very important. Okay. <clears throat> now let us focus a little bit on the ISO 21434, which is a core part of the cybersecurity implementation in the automotive today. So we were talking about this, right? So <clears throat> first one, two, three, four uh, sections are basically trying, to, they give the terminology of the cyber security and the introduction and the jargon and everything. But uh, if you start from the uh, five organizational cyber security management, <coughs> it talks about what kind of the cyber security infrastructure you need to have in your organization so that <coughs> every product or every project implementation can be done with this with that basis. That means you need to have the kind of all the templates of different activities, all the guidelines, how to do a different act, how to do a different uh, various uh, cyber security activities, and how to get it uh, validated, how to get it audited, how to deploy it, how to manufacture it, all these guidelines as per the standard, but in your organization, how we are doing it, how the way you have to implement that, that is all explained in the class five here. So in the class five, the Focus is on the cybersecurity governance in the organization. <clears throat> how the way the culture, that means how the way the each and every employee of the project are probably a practice team or an implementation team, how they need to understand this, how seriously they have to take this one, how they need to be enabled with competency management, <clears throat> how they need to share the information within the organization and outside the organization, how different tools have to be used and what kind of safety security mechanisms are there. So information security management, the configuration management is extremely important. We'll, tell, we'll talk about that more. Organization cyber security audit, how the way you basically clear your cyber security implementation to the end customer again. <clears throat> now, if you leave that point again, once you have the infrastructure, chapter six, the class six here, sorry, and uh, that talks about Using that infrastructure, how you are going to implement your product design and development for each and every project, that's the part of the six. <clears throat> and there is something called seven that talks about the cybersecurity distributed activities as 
we have discussed some time back, right? So, uh, <coughs> cyber security is not done by one organization. It's a supply chain starting from OEM, tier one, tier two services, semiconductors. Many people are there, right? So, having said that, some activities are not allocated to you alone. Some of the activities are distributed among the stakeholders here. How the way the cybersecurity be envisaged, understood, and distributed and handled at different levels. That is explained in the class setting. The class eight talks about how the way you need to check your vulnerability of your product, of your product working environment. Right? <clears throat> cybersecurity class nine talks about the concept. That's where the entire the focus technically means. That means here only we extract the cybersecurity information from scratch and develop the, all the risk data, develop the threat data, develop the cybersecurity goals and decide the controls. Okay. And then based on this data, in the chapter 10, actual development will start. Please understand, I said we have a very important tricky point here. When you start developing any product development, you take the requirements and start doing the design, correct? But to get the cybersecurity requirement, you have to do a lot before to get into the requirement stage. That means a product which is not having a cybersecurity and a product which is having a cybersecurity, the product development life cycle is totally different. Different means it has, in the beginning, before you even start designing the product, you need to consider a lot of cybersecurity activities to consolidate the cybersecurity requirements. Based on that, you can start doing the design, development, validation, and many other things, right? Once the validation is done, there's something called the cybersecurity case, where it validates the the, all the risks are whether all the risks are correctly uh, listed, whether all the risks are correctly handled, the mitigated, and that's the proof based on that assessment and audit can be done. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there is a kind of uh, uh, a little bit of um, problem uh, if you don't take care properly while the production also. That means a, a production in during the production end of line. Uh, testing also, somebody, a issue can be uh, hacked and then it can be uh, disposed with some strong data also. So that's the reason the cyber security need to be working during the manufacturing time also. And the cyber security need to be uh, enabled during the vehicle validation also, right? So that during the vehicle validation, even um, at the time we wanted to, let, let's say the, the life of the product is over, and you just cannot leave it like that because vehicle will have a lot of cybersecurity data that cannot be hacked later also after the vehicle is total. So that's how to handle that. That's the post the uh, post production post maintenance activity also, right? How to end this? So the uh, chapter 15 talks about particularly Tara threat analysis and uh, risk assessment, and uh, we'll go with more details later. So somebody uh, need to. Uh, um, Understand here that cybersecurity is a continuous activity. So if you take any consumer electronic product, right? So the product is designed, developed, released to the market, somebody user buys that over. Of course, there can be a warranty of six months, <clears throat> but it's not like that in the automotive. If a product is deployed, most generally all the OEMs will have 10 years of contract with all the tire one vendors, tire one suppliers. That means but the entire 10 years of cycle or 15 years, whatever based on the contract, all the components within the vehicle, that means all the products within the vehicle, they have to be fit for the cybersecurity related problems. That means any incident happens in between, that means you should be able to understand the incident, you should be able to correct the software and you should be, you should be able to redeploy, redeploy the software to the field. Okay. That means it's a monitoring is continuous and correction is continuous and deployment is continuous. So because of that, people call it a cyber security in automotive is a continuous activity. You look at it. So if you see this loop here, the R national level process infrastructure need to be improved based on the learnings. The vulnerability analysis of the product based on the new things you need to learn and then deploy more controls, right? Basically, because of that, your cybersecurity requirements and configuration management needs, everything will be improvised. The implementation also will be improvised accordingly, and you need to monitor it again and again, right? So we'll go quickly a little bit now. So because we have given um, some information already, 
So this is the first uh, first clause in the 21434, which talks about cyber security management. That means it's as per the uh, WP29 uh, uh, jargon, it is uh, mostly the CSMS, that's called cyber security management systems. Cyber security management talks about how the way a organization need to implement, uh, deploy the cyber security activities at every stage. Okay? So it also need to deploy the process infrastructure, it needs to ensure the culture of the cybersecurity adherent at every stage and cybersecurity risk management and then organizational cybersecurity need to, how it need to be improvised with respect to the latest happenings and then OEM requirements and with respect to the incident management needs. Information sharing. So how I need to, for example, uh, if I have, if I'm working with OEM directly, what kind of information I should be getting from the OEM, I should be watching and what kind of information I should be passing on to the OEM. If I have third party vendors and from where I'm communicating, from where I'm buying some software components, how the way my information sharing should be. The management systems, tools management, and many other things. Right? <clears throat> Somebody can ask you, what is this process infrastructure for? So when you are talking about uh, implementation of cybersecurity in the product development area, you will be doing a lot of cybersecurity activities, right? Like incident response, vulnerability management, security testing, requirements complaints, threat analysis, THARA. So the, the first testing, uh, and penetration testing, the many, many activities you'll be doing. But each and every activity when you're doing, how you need to do, what you need to adhere, what you need to comply, what kind of templates you need to follow, what kind of information you need to have for each and every activity. For that, this uh, CSMS is important. Okay. Talk about the sixth chapter, with uh, sixth class we discussed already, project dependent cyber security activity. So using the infrastructure created in the class five, how each and every product need to be developed, right? So if you base, most of the organizations will have a practice team. The practice team means they are the people who Basically, based on the standards, they create their own infrastructure and they will maintain that. Okay? And based on the updates and then the advancements, they train the people. They will make the they make sure that engineers working on projects are competent, right? And then they see the all at different stages. They audit them. They validate the different artifacts of the product development, right? So they basically in between they. It is required they tailor the process and then they will also try to develop some reusable components which can be used in the cyber security development and then sometimes if you are basically buying a software component from outside what kind of precautions you need to take right so and how they will also do the basically check the cyber security case case means actually it is a, a kind of the validation process whether you are risk assessment and versus your cybersecurity control are in, in tandem with each other, right? So, and uh, whether it is fit for the deployment, whether it is de de uh, whether it is fit for the manufacturing, it is fit for the deployment. Many aspects will be considered in this, right? So, at this one, we have discussed about the case, and we have discussed about the assessment. And uh, if you see the left side of this one, this is an important one. Everybody need to understand. Okay, so. We discussed some time back that item is um, equivalent to your product in the car, right? So every item, just uh, whenever I say item, please think of some product like something like power steering okay? or probably an instrument cluster. So most of them, they will have assets. What is an asset? So asset in the perspective of cybersecurity can be a data element, can be a communication channel, can be an interface, can be anything. The asset basically is, if it is vulnerable, then you can, you are basically, that, that vulnerability is for the product, is creating a cyber security threat for your product, right? So the cyber security properties are analyzed to understand vulnerabilities and threats, and those threats need to be assessed from the risk perspective, and those risks are remodeled as goals. That's, that's what we'll go through it in the coming slides. Yes, so when during the project uh, uh, implementation, this is a simple um, aspect that you need to be in sync with your manufacturer OEM. You need to be in sync with your 
other suppliers or service providers, whoever it is. That because, as I said some time back, cybersecurity is not individual activity, it's a distributed activity. Let us say if cyber if you have a software update, you have the software update, but you cannot do it in the vehicles which are already deployed, correct? So that need to be deployed through the backend server of the OEM. That means OEM is there in the picture. And your cybersecurity implementation should be in line with the, the, the standards and the expectations given by the OEM again. So a lot of, uh, let us say, sometimes that power steering is working with the, in, uh, in combination with some other product, for example. That means operational environment will have some threats for your product also. But that, pro that information will be provided to you by OEM only or probably another type only. So you have a shareability of data, shareability of responsibilities. That's the reason there is something called CIA. The cybersecurity plan will be implemented for every project, which is attached along with a document called CIA document. Okay. The, this document basically, uh, a, it basically uh, gives an, a, a clarity at the beginning of the project that who will do what. So this is where the actual in the cyber security activity will start. Now, if you look at this one, <clears throat> how to start understand the cyber security, right? So if some information or some data is managed to tamper, that's how you basically get the threat, right? How to start that, right? So a lot of cyber security information will be there which is existing within the vehicles, or which is coming from outside. Okay. There are various things. For example, some standards information, some research information coming from outside can be a data, right? But whatever the cyber security engineering data which you are doing on the vehicles, the data coming from CAN network from other issues, data coming from the CAN gateway, there are various scenarios that are coming from, information coming from various sources, right? There are, there are all kind of sources. The, you should not be missing any source. That's the point it is. When you have the sources, you know what kind of cybersecurity information you are getting. Correct? When you analyze this cybersecurity information at which is applicable to at different stages called triggers, right? That means, a, for example, um, to make it very, very uh, simple here for you, <clears throat> you enter a car, right? You open the door, suddenly the cluster in front of you, the cluster means the, the speedometer system behind your cluster, behind your steering wheel, right? There's something, a speedometer, and then everything, how much fuel is there and all, right? That's called instrument cluster. So if you open the door, the cluster will first will need the lamp. It will glow first, correct? It will glow, but it will not be 100% working for you unless you give the ignition again. There are several different stages of the product to work. Normal, the sleeping stage, a normal stage, operational stage, like that. Many stages will be there. That means cybersecurity functionalities, the actual functionalities will start at different stages. Because of that, cybersecurity hacking possibility can happen at different stages. Those are called triggers. If based on the triggers, if you analyze the cybersecurity information, you will get a lot many cybersecurity events. So those events need to be understood. Those events need to be understood in the context of your product architecture, your configuration system, your specification of cybersecurity, your existing the previous vulnerability analysis data. You basically collate all that information, then we will have a list of the weakness points of the system. Okay. So somebody can say that how to understand the weakness of the system, right? There are various ways, how the way, it can be a different uh, relevant applications, it can be source code related vulnerability, it can be network related vulnerability, the backend based, others can be there, right? If you uh, look at the uh, infotainment system, right? The infotainment system, you may see a lot of apps are there, right? Some apps are related to Ghana, some apps are related to weather, some apps are related to something else, correct? That means all these apps are not designed and developed by your OEM. There are third party apps. That means they may have some vulnerabilities in their software that need to be understood, correct? Next thing is you are internal to the products. If you are developing an electronic control unit that is having lots of code, right? 
lot of code other than OS, other than the uh, low level infrastructure, lot of code. How this code to be understood to ensure that that is not having any security threat? Lot of tools are there, lot of scanning systems are there to understand that. So primarily, the most people follow the Misra C guidelines. We'll, we'll go through that again. Uh, some people follow the set standards. So, and uh, on the other side, as I said, there are different networks within the vehicle, right? And different intercommunication channels within the vehicle. How those need to be, we need to run the vulnerability scanning on those interfaces to understand the weakness at every stage. Right? And the way, finally, we discussed heavily the communication with the backend through the telematic system, those vulnerabilities. If you calculate, if you run scanning in every area, you will have a big list of weakness systems, right? Weakness in the system. Right? What need to be done? You need to analyze this weakness with respect to your architecture, with respect to the existing data. Then, then you will understand how the way you need to handle this, right? Vulnerability is a simple vulnerability now, but you still don't know the impact of it. You still don't know what can be the impact, how to handle. You don't, still don't know. This is simple first level information. Really. <clears throat> Look at the, the bottom, the figure here. So uh, this is very important. <clears throat> you first understand. <coughs> Today I'm talking about cybersecurity from the perspective of a tire one product. That means a product, automotive product, like a cluster or power steering AC or something like that. We call that as item. Every item will have a lot of components within that. That means components of components. It the all the components within the item they may have interfaces with each other, and items talks to the other items of the vehicle. That's operational environment. So that are those are the communication channels, and the entire these things are connected to a the network gateway within the vehicle called CAN gateway. So from that, that's where the, all the communications are coming up and then going to different directions and all. And finally, a telematic control system which is connected to the backend. From when you observe, that means at every stage, data crossing from one component to another component, one item to another item, from vehicle to backend, at various levels, different data elements are being used and different interfaces are being used different control methodologies are being used. Based on this, that you have to draw your assets list. The asset, as I said some time back, asset is a data element. It can be a communication data element. It can be internal system functionality parameter. It can be an interface, many things. But these assets are to be safeguarded to ensure the functionality of the product. In order to ensure that you need to secure them. So, how to secure them? First, you need to understand what kind of cybersecurity threat is there for that particular asset property. What are the cybersecurity properties? See, it can be a confidentiality, it can be integrity of the data, it can be availability of the data, it can be many other things, right? When you get all that cybersecurity properties for a particular asset, okay, then you will understand where each asset is vulnerable, right? That's how you understand the damage. Take an example. So I have, have a steering system. If somebody could get the CAN control data to the hacker. We'll see how we later. But that means he can control my ECU of my steering system. That means he can, the damage scenario is vulnerable. It can hit anything, right? Because it, it can, if you're basically slowly moving also, it is drastically moving to right side or left side, slip angle will be too much, and then it will hit anything there. That is a big damage scenario, right? So you need to first, Take the damage scenario. Okay, and from the once you have the damage scenario, means you know the impact, right? Impact on safety, the impact on financial damages, impact on operational damages, impact on the privacy data, right? With respect to all this, you have to draw a damage uh, impact scenario number. There are some methods how to draw the numbers for that. Okay. And uh, you Based on, based on these vulnerabilities, threat scenarios, you need to first of all list out for each damage scenario, what kind of threat scenarios are there. The damage can be created in different many ways, right? So that's these are called threat scenarios. And each threat scenario will have different path, how that scenario can be created in different paths, right? So, so different path, all the paths for all the scenarios have to be extracted. At the same time, all vulnerabilities also 
to be extracted towards the attack path and everything. Now, once you have all the data, so remember, any risk will have two essential things, not necessarily cybersecurity. Any risk will have two essential things. One is called probability, another is impact. So here, that is similar to damage impact rating and the damage feasibility rating. So if these two are combined, you will have the number of risks, cybersecurity risks, which, and each risk will have a risk value. That means the uh, based on the impact and then feasibility rating. So each risk will have a value, risk assessment value. Now I have all the risks here. Risk values are there. Now you may have to uh, 500 to 1000 uh, risk, risks are there. Can I implement cybersecurity like that? It's very difficult, right? You need to group them. You need to group them with respect to a component wise, with respect to a safety functionality wise, different, uh, different uh, terminologies can be used there. Okay. So based on that, you do the grouping and then create the cybersecurity goals. Okay. Cybersecurity goal as per the ISO 2144, which is very important to understand. So once you have the goals, you, the goals have to be given a kind of CAL level, that is assessment level. Based on that, your controls and then implementation can be done. We'll see more how it can be done. Just uh, take a pause. So we were talking about the, uh, the the history of how cybersecurity information is coming up. There were so many projects um, um, proactively created long back, 10 years back, in which one of them is Evita. Okay. Evita is a community that started researching how the way the, the cybersecurity can be enabled in different uh, products and then vehicles. Okay. They have given some kind of important points, very important points. Even now, they are very important in the industry. How they have come up with a concept called HSM, Hardware Security Module, to ensure that how your cryptography modules, blocks can be used in your software, right? How a vehicle software, in vehicle software, and locally stored data need to be infeasible to outside person to detect or to damage, right? That means how you need to make a, a kernel system or any other software to ensure that your internal tasks and internal parameters, functional parameters are secure, right? And uh, issues must be able to detect if messages and data sent by other issues been altered by another agents. So how to, in, that, this is essentially saying that how to pro, uh, protect your interfaces, right? There are so many points like that, but if you look at it, uh, most importantly, the HSM, they come up with the three varieties, Evita, HSM full, HSM medium, and HSM light. Basically, these are for the, the level of the cybersecurity that products. If you are talking about a, uh, a smart actuator, right? So, for example, uh, uh, take uh, sunroof, sunroof motor, right? Now, it is sunroof, earlier sunroof used to have a separate ECU. Now, it is combined with the um, combined with the domain body control, domain controller. Some of them are coming by the concept that domain control is controlling a smart actuator which can control the motors directly. That means the motors will have a, a local small ECU that need to be implemented with cybersecurity. That's where a small HSM light will be used. Even look at it, the most of the European countries, right? The headlights. So headlights are implemented with the adaptive drive beam. That means uh, the drive, the, the, the high, high beam and low beam are manipulated with respect to ADAS data. That means if somebody is coming in front of you, you may have a problem, right? Then that means you will change the direction of your head beam so that you don't get the glare there, right? And let's say if you are going, if you are going on the highway, the road is taking a curve, right? That means you, but lights are showing the straight but you need to take little curvish, right? Because of that, ADAS will give information that road is curving. In the same curvature, your head beams also will move, right? So that means the, uh, the, the reason I was saying this is the headlights are independent nowadays. That means the, each headlight, left and right one, they will have the local ECUs. They will have a, a smart kind of actuator-related stuff, and they will have the HSM light, definitely. 
So there are products, other products which are in the network. Uh, maybe you can say that um, a, a simple body controller or probably a ABS system, they can be used with the medium. Whereas high uh, impact cybersecurity products like uh, input and unit, like uh, head unit, telematics, and a gateway unit, they have to be used with the Avita HSM fully. But however, the Avita project has been uh, stalled during, uh, I think, uh, 2015. But nowadays, there are a lot of research going on, a lot of advanced HSMs are coming up. So the reason being is <clears throat> number of the functionalities are increasing. The functionalities are increasing because of that, the microcontrollers are very powerful these days. They are coming with the, the multi-core controllers. So the how HSM need to be given for a multi-core controller. These are all the advanced things happening. Okay. <clears throat> now coming to the concept. The concept is basically we have in the previous stage we have discussed right all the risks are accumulated right how these risks have to be understood and how Tara need to be done and how cybersecurity requirements need to be created that will be there in this chapter. Now, look at this one. Earlier, we were talking about item, right? So somebody may uh, ask, what is the criteria to define an item, right? So let's say if it is not correct to the ER picture, that's not an item, forget it, okay? So if uh, does the candidate contain interfaces external to the vehicle? Yes, then it is an item, no? Then you have to check, does it have the safety of the operation of the vehicle? Yes. Does it have the wireless interfaces? Yes. Then do you have the external connectivity with the cloud and all? The data need to be managed? Yes. If this criteria is there, it is an item. For example, there is an ECU sometimes, a switch and a fuse relay box. It may not be a, sometimes in some vehicles, it is not connected to the any network. So it is electrical based. So that means it may not be an item there. Okay. There can be some other things also. But nowadays, even switches and fuse uh, fuse related uh, uh, issues are connected to the CAN systems, and they have the safety SL levels as well. Now, as discussed some time back, we have two types of security problems. One is a coming from problem cybersecurity problem coming from externally, and a problem internally also, right? So, an external pro person will try to hack your data and get into the system and, and spoil something, okay? Tamper something and spoil something. But whereas a de designer will focus, he will not know much more about the external point, but whereas he will try to focus more on stability and strength of the design in such a way that it protects its system from external threats. So your internal assessment of cybersecurity is more like vulnerability analysis. And then the the cyber security assessment, which is coming, the threat coming from outside is called the threat assessment, it's called Tara, right? Now, this is uh, this is a typical picture of how Tara and vulnerability can be managed, right? Look at this, the right side, the flow diagram. So the item definition need to be done, then assets, assets means all the, the assets are the main backbone to understand the cyber security, right? So assets need to be identified, Based on the assets, you need to do the damage scenarios. Based on the damage scenarios, we explained this. You will have impact rating. And from each damage scenario, you understand cybersecurity threats, different threats. On each threat, how different paths can be there. You need to determine the paths. Finally, you will have the risk determination, right? The risk determination is done, then you have complete all the risks within the system, right? These risks, once you have the risks, what do you know? You will have to understand how they need to be mitigated. You are, as you are aware, generally any risk can be mitigated completely, but sometimes you cannot mitigate the risk 100%. That means you will have some residual risk there. That's called cyber security claim here. Sometimes you cannot fix the problem at all. That's also a cyber security claim. But how do you, can you manage to go ahead with that risk? That's the, that's the uh, kind of call you have to take to before releasing the product, okay? Your OEM has to accept. So this is an example how assets have to be identified, okay? And then this is one interesting aspect here. 
anybody who worked on any risk risk analysis in their lifetime they'll understand that a risk understand understanding at the beginning of the project can be something while you are getting the clarity of the project the risk clarity will be more the based on by and by you implement the controls the risk impact uh, can be going high or going low it depends upon the internal and external events right now that means risk may risk levels may vary in the life cycle but if you it is varying how can you control the cyber security right that's the reason they say the iso 2144 comes up with the standard as a terminological care level that means based on the standard parameters like attack vectors and all you finalize the cal right based on that you go ahead with the controls and validation and everything so as i said some time back right from the damage scenarios what you need to do you need to basically identify the impact from the scenarios from the safety perspective and financial perspective operational perspective and then privacy perspective these are some kind of rule book how to do that from the threat scenario identification generally we we'll have a lot of methodologies here so uh, people use stride is one of the old method it's a stride is a quality to uh, methodology tool but there are so many other methods in the the quantitative methods also that like cvss and attack potential and other things so nowadays many people are using combinational strings also so the idea is to have the all the threat and scenarios identified with respect to your assets identified right so how you how to do it so how to do it so you need to start with something which will have a data interfaces within your component within the components of your item and the components of the external item in the external environment once you have all the component components affected all the interfaces are affected and all the information data flow is affected then you will understand definitely where this threat scenario can happen there are ways from this uh, uh, from from the previous data flow diagrams so you can basically use a, a, a attack tree method a, a bottom up method is mostly good because you start with the uh, you start with the information and then improvise on that and then complete information will be dig down but most of the times when you start at the beginning you don't have a lot of data then you do the top down approach but the idea is to have all the paths for a particular threat scenario need to be documented so then only you will know all the risks there right so attack visibility rating so we have as we discussed each security <coughs> cyber security is a risk cyber cyber security risk it is risk will have the, the impact that is the damage scenario from the damage scenario it is coming up right you have already seen that now the probability the feasibility rating so for the feasibility rating there are methods <coughs> again to understand that attack potential method attack vector method and cvs method you can see that more this is <coughs> a kind of a scenario for to understand the attack path and this is a attack potential method from how to do quantitatively the giving the numbers and then coming up with the attack feasibility rating so it talks it, it is based on some parameters like elapsed time the specialist expertise the knowledge of the item the window of opportunity and the equipment so this is available anywhere but if how to uh, imply that in a particular automotive scenario automotive scenario is the experience there so this is an example of what we have seen earlier and the risk determination so now you are combining the feasibility rate and impact rating and finally you are getting complete risk data risk values each risk will have value if you look at the top uh, table there right uh, whenever it is severe and the visibility rating is high that is called risk 5 rating is 5 that is highest risk with respect to cyber security understand one tricky point here so you are basically taking the impact rating severity that means the severity is mostly coming from the safety perspective that is also a coming from the standard so whenever you talk about cyber security you are partially talking about the functional safety also here right so this is once you have all the risk 
then you will know, right? As we discussed some time back, whether you need to mitigate it or you going to just leave it like that. You wanted to reduce it. You wanted to replace or you want to delete the complete requirement, something like that, right? So the goal process is an interesting phenomenon. The, in the automotive te technical terminology, uh, you have requirements, right? Several security risks are there. You need to convert them like goals. How to, to convert them? That means you are grouping them. Grouping them with respect to safety, with respect to component binding, with respect to the way it is implemented and then functionally operated. It's an experience. There are no methodologies, but it comes with the experience generally. From the cybersecurity, uh, once the cybersecurity goals are there, they will be given to a uh, process called cybersecurity concept. So with the architecture, with the cybersecurity goals, and with the kind of information you have on the controls, what kind of cryptography algorithm I need to implement to control that interface? What kind of uh, in communication I need to have? If I'm downloading some uh, uh, kind of data or some kind of software file from the back and what kind of hash I need to use? These are all kind of controls, right? Different controls. What kind of whitelisting I need to have on the tasks? What kind of whitelisting I need to have on the uh, parameters of the functionalities? These are all basically in the concept. You know the controls, you know the requirements, you know the goals. So you come up with a concept. From them, actually what you are doing is you are extracting the cybersecurity requirements. This is where first we talk about cybersecurity requirements. You need to do all this to arrive at cybersecurity requirements. Based on that, actual product development can start. Right? So th this is a uh, phenomenon of how the product developments can be done. You do the goals and then the requirements are coming up. From the requirements, you need to have, see how the architecture can be impacted, right? The, and then you need to be, sometimes you, while controlling, while basically designing your system, you understand that the cyber security requirement need to be modified. It need to be refined. You understand that sometimes you, you may realize that this vulnerability activity need to be revisited again. Something like that. So while actually doing the design, it is very common in the cybersecurity practice that you will be refining the cybersecurity requirements. You'll be refining the architecture design itself. You'll be refining your strategy of vulnerability analysis. So because of that, so many many of the documents will come again. So you look, look at this one, the class 9, 10, 11, which talks about various things. 9 talks about concept. So develop class 10 talks about the the development and then verification and validation and then production, right? What you need to do at each stage. So take a pause here. So we were talking about vulnerability some time back, right? Let us uh, keep aside all the vulnerabilities which are coming from externally, but internally what vulnerabilities you have? Let us say somebody has not protected the variables. Okay. So then obviously it will be available outside then, right? How to protect them? How to, if let us say, how different uh, strategies, static analysis and diamond dynamic analysis rules set by Mishra, set and other standards, how they can cause safety and security vulnerabilities, that is a big activity again, okay? So you need, somebody need to understand all those rules from those standards and then basically create your cybersecurity coding standards for your organization. And you need to check the software with respect to all those uh, tools and then check the what kind of violations are there in your code. If you look at the MISRA, MISRA has, I believe, uh, 16 mandatory rules are there. If those rules are broken, you need to immediately fix them. That can create any safety or security vulnerability tomorrow. Similarly, you need to run those tools and understand the vulnerabilities, fix them. And then you need to continue with controls again. So as I said some time back, while doing the design and development, you realize that a lot of cybersecurity requirements and vulnerability analysis need to be visited and they need to be refined. Okay. Now coming up to this one, integration and verification, right? So you are developing your software, and then you know that how many components are there within your system, and you know. What are the uh, data interfaces and event interfaces between your components? What is the kind of interfaces and data transaction between external components? You know everything, right? That means 
when you are doing the software integration between the companies, you should be testing those interfaces very thoroughly. That's each data element transaction can be an asset and that can cause vulnerability for your cybersecurity problems, right? So in the cybersecurity implementation, integration testing is a very important activity. So there is something called the verification and verification. The, the, when we talk about the verification, so mostly the kind of the basic interfaces testing and basic data analysis, basic code level standards compliance. After this, you need to do validation also. The validations are uh, three, four types in the cybersecurity. The normal functional security, anyway, need to do it. There is something called the fuzz testing and there is something called penetration testing. Okay. How we need to do, let's go through and understand this. Look at this one. So functional testing, you need to be done for all the CALs of any cybersecurity goal. But vulnerability scanning need to be done, again, for all of them. But first testing need to be done for CAL2, CAL3, CAL4, and penetration testing need to be done for the CAL3 and CAL4. That means you need to have different data sets also to ensure that you are testing it properly, right? So just to understand what is first testing, what is penetration testing, right? So the first testing, basically, you need to do a lot of uh, the black box testing and then first testing. But whereas in the uh, penetration testing, you cannot say that it is a black box completely, right? But it sometimes it is a white box testing also. That's the reason people call it as penetration testing is more suitable to say that it is a gray box testing. That means, let us say, if you have a lot of parameters which you are testing along with the HSM interaction, that can be generally mostly white box testing. But if you are basically testing the, the CAN data, communication data only, you can use some tools and then track the data, bus uh, protocol, bus analyzers, and many other things. So it is a combination of both. <clears throat> so you now coming to the production. So the, in production phase, uh, as I said, your first time you are fusing your software to your ECU. And that's the first time you are getting into a operational mode of manufacturing and testing various <clears throat> subsystems of your ECU. Right? First time you are, first, for example, let us say, if you have a cluster, instrument cluster, you give some input data and see the speedometer is working. You give some data to see that the RPM is working, to see that uh, all, the, all the, most of the Hardware components and the basic components of the product will be tested over there. But that is tested from the manufacturing context only. Now, you are doing that much data, that much activity there. All that activity need to be protected again, definitely protected. So what kind of controls you will, of course, first time you are using your keys also, cyber secret keys and all of everything you are using in the first time into the issue that time on itself. What kind of precautions you need to have? One, what kind of control plan you need to have? All discussed in the production. So, <clears throat> operations and maintenance very important activity. At the beginning of the session, we discussed the instant response plan is very important. That means once you manufacture and deploy the product to the field, it's not sufficient. You need to see what kind of vulnerability events are happening. You need to monitor them. Where any of those events can be dangerous to treat. If something already threat happens, how to handle it so fast, right? Is it contagious really? The same kind of the hacking can happen to other vehicles. How to control the situation? So this is all happening in the operational maintenance. There is a process specifically mentioned in the standard called incident response plan and incident response information. This, this process basically tells you how to analyze the incident how to analyze the data with respect to cybersecurity risks, vulnerability data, threat data, perform the uh, Tara again, perform risks again, and see what is the impact on the cybersecurity requirement. Initially, you have envisaged and what is the change now, and what is the impact of those cybersecurity requirements on the controls. Right? So you need to do that if there is any change in the software, if there is any change in the environment of the software, or configuration management, any configurable kind of parameters, you need to re-flash that again on your issues using the back and forth system again or manually whatever. Decommissioning, we, we have already told you, this is to basically protect somebody's personal information and uh, to, in order to ensure that while decommissioning that is 
completely reversed and uh, not not been stolen away. Now, having said that, uh, now we have discussed about the ISO 21434, how it is being implemented in the industry. So let us have a few minutes uh, on what is happening in the automotive industry, why cybersecurity is so relevant uh, now. Okay. Everybody knows that autonomous car research is going very speed, very, very high speed. And Tesla is already deployed, they, uh, and then many other cars are deploying. So cyber, autom autonomous cars are being deployed at uh, five, five, zero to five levels. Okay. So presently, most of the European countries are at the level three now. So just one second, please. Yeah, Ashin. Yeah. So, uh, so I am taking more time. Maybe I'll wind it up in the next five to ten minutes. Okay. Uh, if uh, more autonomous levels are happening, that means it is connected to the backend system and a lot of external systems. That means vulnerability of a car to get hacked is more. That means cyber security implementation need to be more strict way. That means it need to be done at more deeper way, right? And this error sensor, the, the critical element of uh, autonomous um, implementation is ADAS. So ADAS means actually how the way it will identify an object on the road, it will identify many things uh, with respect to the radar, lidar, and camera based technologies. People do is something called uh, sensor fusion to get the data and based on that data people implement the control on the vehicle automatically from the uh, at, uh, autonomous car is used and gets a lot of data map data also from the back side back inside so that means it's more vulnerable here similarly the, if you look at the electric vehicle infrastructure it is connected to the charging station and it is connected to the back ends for the data and it is st still more vulnerable so now the a lot of focus is happening on the entry point of the vehicle. That's called telematics unit. The telematics unit, uh, uh, how the weight need to be architected for the future purpose. And there is something called uh, uh, connected car consortium, which gives basically, uh, sorry, connected car consortium, it talks about the, the keys, the mobile based keys to secure your car and your car data. So these are all things happening now. So. There's, now let's come to the uh, summary point. Cybersecurity threats to the vehicle are critically increasing. Standards, procedures, framework are being established to address the same. Standards of ISO 21434, uh, WP29 uh, standards are very much in the plane today and they are being finalized in the coming few months. Future trends related to autonomous car, connected car, CCC, we have discussed these trends, how it is impacting the future cybersecurity and HSM deployment and then it is more coming up more better. But still people are saying that it, the way the, the speed of the systems are coming up, it is uh, brute force can be more, much more possible to break these algorithms. So that means HSM need to be much more powerful tomorrow with more powerful algorithms. That's a quantum uh, analysis. People are working on that. Software and vulnerabilities are major concerns as of today. Cyber security uh, is valid till the end of the product. So it's not just the development side, till the end of the life of the product, cyber security need to be ensured. So with this, uh, I'm completing my presentation. Uh, just simply the little bit about our company. So we are, is, uh, we are um, seriously consulting services. We have a strong team and then experts on the ISO 21434 and functional safety 26262. We also uh, have a good experience on the connected car and EV systems, chassis and telematics. We do a lot of training for at various stages for the from the, for the experienced people as well as the freshers also. And uh, these are different services on the uh, telematics side and then functional safety side and security side. And these are the services, particularly for the safety and security side. So now I'll open the floor for questions.
thank you so much for your time, sir. Uh, and uh, thank you for uh, contributing to the cyber school uh, with your expert lecture. Um, personally, I uh, feel like uh, before this lecture, I barely knew anything about automotive security and uh, uh, you gave us really deep technical insight into the subject. Uh, it is projected that by 2028, the industry is going to reach a market value of $8 billion. So um, I'm sure that uh, uh, all of our students are uh, are now uh, really enlightened in this uh, rapidly growing sector. And uh, thank you for that again, sir. Uh, I believe uh, we uh, ran out of time uh, for questions, but uh, please uh, do send me your questions in email. And uh, if uh, Mr. Chandra Sakar can uh, uh, can uh, take his time, I will uh, send uh, send uh, him uh, the questions in email if that's okay. Yeah, my mail ID has been given in the screenshot here, and my LinkedIn also has been given. So if anybody has thank you, sir, to uh, discuss, that's fine. Thank you, sir. We really appreciate the expert lecture, and uh, we hope to see you at uh, the IDCSS 23 next year as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all of you.